So, good afternoon to the viewers in uh, India, and good evening to the viewers in uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and Asia, and good morning to the rest of the world. So, uh, I have the great opportunity to welcome you all, and I request uh, Ishitaya to start the program. Thank you so much, Dr. Natarajan. Um, good evening and a very warm welcome to the seventh Public Endowment Award lecture by Dr. Tian Wong for the late professor, Dr. N.S. Sundaram and his wife, Mrs. Kam Kamla Sundaram, organized by Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital. I now request Ms. Shubha Urankar, Executive Secretary to Professor Dr. S. Natarajan to begin the event with a welcome address. Over to you, uh, Ms. Shubha. Thank you, Dr. Ishita. Hello, everyone. Uh, I take this opportunity to welcome you all to the late Professor Dr. N.S. Sundaram and Srimati Kamala Sundaram, 7th Public Endowment Award Lecture. Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital is also celebrating its 30th anniversary in the year 2021, along with Singapore National Eye Center. First and foremost, I extend my heartiest welcome to Dr. Teen Wong, Professor and Medical Director, Singapore National Eye Center for the year 2020. I would like to welcome the Aditya Jodh family headed by Professor Dr. S. Natarajan, Chairman and Founder of Aditya Jodh Hospital and Dr. Radhika Krishnan, Medical Director of Aditya Jodh Hospital, Natarajan. Now I would like to welcome all our other speakers, Dr. Ishita Ayer, Dr. Aishwarya Ayer, Ms. Shruti Chawla, Ms. Sanjali Mahadik, my biggest and warmest welcome to our dear viewers and audience. Thank you all, and I'm handing over to Dr. Ishita. Thank you so much, Ms. Shubha, for the lovely welcome. I would now like to call upon the invocation of Goddess Saraswati with a devotional song, followed by the lighting of the lamp. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I would now like to invite Ms. Shruti Chawla, Head of Optometry. No, we have the lighting of lamp. Okay. All right. Uh, Shruti, uh, Ishita, we have lighting of the lamp. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can we commence with the lighting of the lamp? You can hear me. Nati, you can hear me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome, uh, Mr. Shivanandan. We have just started with the invocation song and uh, welcome, sir. Shishita. All right. Thank you so much for um, that wonderful piece of music and the lighting of the lamp. 
with the blessings of uh, Goddess Saraswati now, I would like to invite Ms. Shruti Chawda, head of optometry at Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital, to share a few words about the hospital. Over to you, Ms. Shruti. Thank you, Dr. Ishita. Can you see the slide? Yes, we can see the slide. Yes. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving me opportunity. Next slide me nahi ja raha enterprise ko mujhe share kar do. Do all arrow press kar. Screen is visible sir? No no, you have to you have stop the sharing the screen. You have to share the screen again. Share screen ko share screen ko maine kiya. One second karo. Zoom ho jaye. Now? Yes, we can. Yeah. We can make the full screen. So, Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital have more than two decades of services with more than hundred years of combined experience, hands in eye care. We are one of the very few hospitals with all the specialties of eye care under one roof, making cross consultations easy and seamless. So our vision is Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital strives to provide world-class eye care service under one roof by innovative service through research. And mission is Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital will remain attentive to the eye care and well-being of those we serve through patient-focused care with 100% patient satisfaction with 0% error, patient education and innovative services. So I, would like, I would like to introduce our founder and chairman, Professor Dr. S. Natrajan. Dr. S. Natrajan is a third generation ophthalmologist. He is internationally renowned vitro-retinal surgeon since 1984 from Shankar Netralaya. He established the Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital as an international center for vitro retinal surgery and research. He has performed more than 60,000 exclusive vitro retinal surgeries. He trained 64 vitro retinal surgeons from India and all over the world. He has 999 scientific presentations at national and international level, 104 publications in journals, and five chapters in books till 20th June. 2016. So Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital offers services like retina, cataract, cornea services, orbit and oculoplasty, neuro-ophthalmology, glaucoma, sutureless corneal transplantation, pediatric ophthalmology and squint clinic, contact lenses, refractive and LASIK surgeries, uveitis, ocular processes and low vision aids. These are the diagnostic services offered at Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital. We are also an education center for postgraduate DNB and FNB course, cornea fellowship, PECO and SSCS fellowship, pediatric fellowship, medical retina fellowship, vitro retinal fellowship, and center for conducting DNB and ICO examination. These are the few achievements of Aditya Jyot Eye Hospitals. We are ISO certified eye hospital. Accredited by NABH, the first eye hospital in Mumbai, first eye hospital in Western India, and we are the WASH certified. We have MOU with Maastricht University for being the center for PhD exchange program. We have MOU with Second Sight for Artificial Retina, and we have MOU with NCRM, that, that is Nishi in Center for Regenerative Medicine and IOBA, in Institute for Research in Ophthalmology. This is the Emsler Garden. So we are the first vertical Emsler Garden in the world 
was inaugurated by to, uh, on 28th January 2014 in premises of Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital at Wadala by Shri Shushil Kumar Shinde, Honorable Home Minister, the Government of India and Dr. Neil Bressler, Chief Retina Division and Professor of Ophthalmology. So uh, this is our patient outreach. Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital in tandem with Aditya Jyot Foundation conducts free eye examination camps at various public places, schools, companies for the welfare of its community. So these are a few images of our camps. So I would like to introduce Aditya Jyot Foundation for Twinkling Little Eyes. So it is supported by Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital Private Limited. It is a charitable trust with outreach program aiming to redress the suffering of low income groups, rural and urban slums and tribal areas through free eye camps and treatments. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Shruti, for such a wonderful introduction to Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital. I would now like to call upon Mr. N. Ravi Chandran, former CEO and a dear advisor and friend to Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital to speak on the endowment award. Over to you, Ravi, sir. Mr. Ravi? Yeah, you have to unmute uh, Ravi. You have to unmute, uh, Ravi. You have to unmute. You are muted. R Ravi, you are muted. Ravi, sir, kindly unmute. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Can so you hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank you. you. Yes. You can make it full screen. Good evening, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Professor Dr. N. S. Sundara and Mrs. Kamala Sundaram, seventh endowment award lecture. I will take this opportunity to express my deep appreciation for Professor Dr. Wong Sin N. This endowment award initiated in 2013 in the name of late Professor Dr. Sundaram and Mrs. Kamala Sundaram. It is given annually to an eminent personality who has exemplary contributions in the fight and eradication of blindness globally, and who has, who has made great contributions in any field of science and education that helps alleviate the suffering of humankind. Dr. N. S. Sundaram, born on 24th January 1927, passed away 17th April 2015. He was superintendent Government Ophthalmic Hospital and Professor of Ophthalmology, Madras Medical College, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. When you are Superintendent of Government Ophthalmic College Hospital, he started nine special clinics, uh, particularly a special clinic, first of its kind, introduced by the Government of Tamil Nadu on genetics, performed over 30,000 cataract surgeries for the poor individually and organized more than 100,000 surgeries, refraction of nearly 300,000 people in camp. He has conducted hundreds of eye camps during services under government programs under banner NSS Eye Trust with the NGO organization. Lastly, he served as the rector of Aditya Jyot Institute of Optometry and mentor of Aditya Jyot Foundation for Twinkling Little Light. He is recipient of several awards, such as Seva Ratna by Centenarian Trust, Vaidya Ratna by Sri Kanchi Kamakoti Jaijindra Swamikam, Lifetime Achievement Award by Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association and Dr. MGR Medical University, Dr. GB Award for Community Ophthalmology. And he authored many books, like I Care for Both Young and Old, and he has written several 
informatic articles and leaflets and pamphlets on several topics in English, Hindi, and Chinese. Your net is uh, not stable, I think. And Galkoma, Dipetan. Mrs. Kamala Sundaran was known for her grit and perseverance. She was instrumental for all the successes for the entire family. In 55 years of married life, blessed with two sons and a daughter. The eldest being Professor Dr. S. Narajan, the third generation ophthalmologist, and chairman and managing director, Aditya Jyot Ayyoshi. These some of the sweet memories I shared with him when I was in IIT Jyoti I Hospital with Professor Dr. Sundaran. This when he was with uh, the former president, Dr. Abdul Kalam, and uh, during the World Eye Hospital visitation, and the second gentleman award with Charity Way and Neil uh, Kirsten, and also we have another vision when Dr. Narajan had his Batman And some of the past. Award recipients, Dr. Yan Yan Prakash, Dr. Neil Bressler, Dr. Marka Mura, Dr. Rishi Singh, Dr. Francisco Bandala, Dr. Srinivas Sada. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ravi, sir. I would now like to hand it over to Padma Shri Professor Dr. S. Natarajan, chairman, chairman and Managing Director of Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital to formally introduce Dr. Wong, read the scroll, scroll followed by the conferring of the plaque. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all and thank you, Ishita. And I first thank uh, Professor Dean Wong, my good old friend, and uh, for his contribution. I to Youth I Hospital Private Limited, Mumbai, India, presents this scroll of honor on the occasion of the seventh of the NF Sundram and Mrs. Kamala Sundram Public Endowment Award on Friday, 22nd January 2021, to Professor Dean Y. Wong, MD, PhD, Arthur Lim, Professor of Ophthalmology, Medical Director, Singapore National Eye Center Chairman, Singapore Eye Research Institute, Wise Dean, Duke NUS Medical School, National University of Singapore. And uh, Professor Wong completed medical school at the National University of Singapore, NUS. He obtained an MPH and a PhD from the Johns Hopkins University, USA, and received his clinical residency training in ophthalmology at the Singapore National Science Center, SNEC. Professor Wong is currently the medical director of the SNEC and was previously chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at NUS and chair of the University of Melbourne, Australia. Professor Wong has published more than 1,300 peer reviewed papers and is a highly cited researcher. He has given more than 400 invited, named plenary and symposium lectures globally and received more than US 850 million in grant funding. He is a two time recipient of the Singapore Transnational Researcher SCAR Award 2008 and 2014. He is a board member of the International Council of Ophthalmology, and the Academy of Medicine Singapore, the Singapore Medical Council, and the National Medical Research Council Singapore for his contributions. Professor Wong has been recognized with the Austrian Commonwealth. Health Minister's Award, the Arnold Pass Medal for the, from the Macular Society, the Alcon Research Institute Award, and others. He has received the National Outstanding Clinician Scientist Award, the President's Science Award, and the President's Science and Technology Award, the highest award for healthcare and uh, scientific contribution in Singapore, signed by myself. And we have already, uh, thanks to Professor Gangadhar Sundar, who has already handed over in person uh, to Professor Team Wong. So thanks to Ganga and thanks to and also, we have a parallel clock here, which I'm going to hang in our hospital, and I'm sure we already handed over, and you have it with you. Maybe you can show the clock to the, uh, the people here. Thank you, team. Yes, and that's the clock. Already he has got it and in Singapore. Thank you, Professor Team, for accepting it. And uh, here it says the Professor Team Wong, and uh, for his contribution in the field of research and automated retinal image analysis, Substructure assessment and advanced retinal imaging technologies. So, with this, uh, I uh, I request you to give the oration for the team one, and I'm happy we work together in the ICO and many other things, and 
we hope to work with you on AI and that's your topic and that is the work method. And you saw Charity Y1 during one of our visits here. And we are glad. We also congratulate Singapore National AI Center celebrating 30th anniversary. And we also have St. Eric's Hospital celebrating 30th anniversary. Thank you very much. Uh, a very good afternoon, and I would like to first and uh, foremost uh, thank, uh, of course, my very good friend and colleague, which, who I've known for maybe 15, 20 years now, uh, Professor Dr. S. Natarajan, uh, who is the Chairman and Medi Managing Director of the Aditya Joint Eye Hospital. I'd like to congratulate the hospital, which is its 30th year anniversary, same age as the Singapore National Eye Center. So we've shared similar journey. Uh, I think uh, Nata, as we call each other, call him, uh, has been one of the uh, really eminent ophthalmologists and retinal specialists from India. I mean, India is a big place uh, and uh, there are many famous people, but Nata ranks really highly in India and globally. So I'm really very honored to receive this award and this public endowment lecture. Uh, I've seen the people that have gotten this lecture and they are all giants in ophthalmology, New Brester, uh, Vasada and so forth. Uh, so I'm very honored and humbled to receive this lecture. So I'm going to get started. And once again, I hope that uh, this lecture will uh, bring our two hospitals closer together and maybe there's some way of uh, being uh, collaboration and as well as, of course, further uh, research and education. So I'm going to speak about AI in the current state of the arts. These are my financial disclosures. As a lot of you would know, this is a very exciting area. And a few years ago, when the Google CEO um, said that Google was going into AI and generate a lot of interest. And I think that that was when people started waking up and saying AI is here in ophthalmology. But when you look at what is AI, it started really in the 1950s. And it's only in the 1980s that there was a further development in machine learning. And in the 2010s, deep learning which is the latest technology for AI, and there'll be others to come, really generated interest because it was shown to be really superior performance. Now, what do I mean by that? The traditional machine learning reaches amount of performance that is good, but maybe not useful enough for clinicians. Deep learning is now seems that it has exceeded human performance in very specific tasks. And in various papers, not just in ophthalmology, but for example, in diagnosis of cancers in pathology and in recognizing skin cancer, AI has surpassed the specialists and the clinicians in terms of diagnosis. So I think we are now at the threshold whereby we really can put AI to use. However, I want to mention that it's not always been that way. Many years of disappointment, and every time we say something about AI, we feel that it takes 10 years, 15 years, and still nothing has happened. And that's certainly what we are seeing for medicine, computer, and AI. So it's not so simple to bring a technology to what we say is the very traditional practice of medicine. Now, what is the current state of the arts? I'm going to be giving you an overview and I'll concentrate on two areas. First, I'm going to talk about diabetic retinopathy screening. It's very relevant for Singapore. It's obviously relevant for India and for Asia. Now, there's been other things like using OCT, macular disease, glaucoma, others. 
I would not speak about these because it would take too long for me to cover everything. I'll highlight one or two examples. And then I'll go into a new area that has generated very significant interest. Can we use the eye and the retina in particular to diagnose and predict systemic disease? That's a very exciting area. And that's something that all of us really feels maybe that's the next frontier. So I'm going to concentrate on DR screening and systemic disease prediction. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about what do we use. Basically, there are two modalities that is now heavily used. Of course, it's fundus photo, and the other is OCT. But AI for fundus photo has several advantages. Number one, cameras are available everywhere. It's cheaper. The data sets are larger, and there are a lot of historical studies. The image is 2D, so you need not have a lot of storage in IT platforms. So it's relevant, for example, in India and in many other countries. OCT, unfortunately, it's not as widely available. It is useful in really specialist centers. And there are fewer relevant data sets because spectral domain OCT has not been around as long as fundus photograph. The image is three-dimensional and therefore you need very heavy IT infrastructure, including enhanced GPU systems to support OCT. So let me give you a few examples before I go to diabetic retinopathy screen. So fundus photograph for AMD has been used and it's now been tested on Arabs and there's been a few studies here and there. AI for glaucoma has also been used with good performance. We've also published a study and several others using AI to detect optic disc disease, papilledema, and showing that maybe it can be useful for neurologists, general physicians, ER physicians, other people that don't know how to look at this because why do they need to learn about rare conditions uh, uh, when they have not much opportunity to look at normal and abnormal optic discs? This is Dan Miller, my colleague, and we are now testing out some of this system in the emergency room with portable cameras. Now, if I look at AI for OCT, AI for OCT there's been... It can be used to diagnose single diseases, such as AMD, diagnosis of multiple diseases such as AMD, AMD, AMD pain solutions, etc. It's been used for decision support for screening and referral. So two examples are shown here. One is from Google DeepMind, looking at performing and predicting different diseases. And another is looking at predicting of wet AMD. Now I'm going to go into diabetic retinopathy screening, which is the first example that I think have made significant progress. Of course, there's been many algorithms that some of you might be aware of. Google has one, but there's also IDX, iNode, and there's also Iris. We know that diabetic retinopathy is a big problem, and really we need to screen patients so that those that do not need to be referred can stay in the primary care setting, and those that need to be referred can be seen by ophthalmologists, and maybe they need treatment. We know that if you screen it well, you actually reduce blindness. Now, I know that there are multiple different screening programs in India, in different cities and different regions, and that has also been very successful. Now, I'll share with you what we have done in Singapore. We started developing guidelines as far back as 2004, 
And 10 years later, we are still persuading the government to support a national screening program. So it does, it's not easy to even ask a small country to support a screening program. But we managed to start in 2010, and we are now having a national screening program that covers 19 primary care clinics across Singapore. And what do we do with these screening programs? The nurses take a photo, the photographs are uploaded onto a server and they are sent to a reading center. So it's on the same server. The reading center reads the photos by technicians and gives a report which are transmitted on the same day, sometimes in less than one hour to the clinic and the physicians therefore will say whether or not you need or do not need to go to eye specialist clinics. When we started doing this, we've gotten significant uptake and every year now we cover maybe 100, 120,000 patients yearly. So the question is, how do you sustain this program? Well, one way of course is to use AI to help us. Now, Gushan et al. in a landmark paper by published in JAMA in 2016, suggested that they perform extremely well compared to specialists as well as graders. It's now been used and tested in Thailand and also in India, showing very good performance. So I think there's a lot of excitement using Google's algorithm. Now, when we develop our system, we use half a million images whereby we split them into training and testing data sets. And we also found good performance, but we use a lot more real life images as opposed to Google's paper, which use much more standardized, clear cut images that they have gotten from clinical trials. We then tested this in different population and clinic based studies. In one paper, we did what we call a very challenging setting, testing it in African populations whereby patients would have cataract, small pupils, and uh, difficulty in transmitting photos and so forth. And we found that it performed well in that setting. And therefore now there's a lot of attention on this program, Selena Plus, We've also licensed this to a startup company that's now gotten approvals in EU, in different countries and so forth. And I think it's quite useful. Now, what does the Selena Plus, why is it successful? I think the success of this AI program poses very important lessons. The first is that if you want to develop a program like Selena Plus, you need a robust tele-ophthalmology service whereby the AI program can sit in. And therefore, the tele-ophthalmology service should have a clearly defined problem and gap, use simple technology like standard fundus cameras. Diabetic retinopathy obviously does not require additional data, so that's useful. There's already a lot of cost-effective and outcomes evidence. And the impact of change is on GPs, so they are not worried and fearful. When we develop the AI system, then therefore the program is an incremental and not such a disruptive change because it is replacing the AI, replacing graders rather than ophthalmologists. And therefore, the impact of change is not so significant and fearful. Now I'm going to go into the next topic, which is from AI on the eye to cardiovascular disease, because I think those that is very exciting. We now know for a long time now that the retina provides an opportunity to study cardiovascular disease. We all know that hypertensive retinopathy is a well-established target and organ damage, you know, shown by Keith, Wagner, Barker, and other people, showing that 
if you see these signs, which are quite common in a general population, microaneurysms, AV nipping, flame and dot hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, these signs are predictive of a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke, and it's been seen in many different population studies. And therefore, in many guidelines, including the most recent European Society for Cardiology and Society for Hypertension guidelines, they recommend that fundoscopy to detect hypertensive retinopathy continues to be an as important way of assessing people with hypertension. And it really suggests that if we are able to provide information from the eye, it will help cardiologists, physicians to manage their patients. Of course, using the AI to predict systemic disease has now have some significant height because of one of the major papers by Google, which I'll show in a second. But essentially the framework goes like this. You either can use AI on color fundus photograph to estimate risk factors of the disease. You can use it to replace an existing biomarker of a disease, or you can predict the disease itself. There are three approaches. So let's look at each of the three approaches. The first approach is to use the AI to estimate systemic risk factors. In this very significant paper in 2018 by Google's group, they were able to predict significant factors such as the age of the patient. You can see here the actual versus the predicted age. The blood pressure, you can see the actual versus predicted blood pressure, showing that you can predict a range of risk factors from a color fundus photograph. We recently published a paper in Lancet Digital Health to also estimate a range of systemic risk factors, but not all systemic risk factors can be predicted. In fact, many could not be seen or discovered from retinal photographs. So it is useful, but maybe it can't be do it done for everything. A second way of doing this is to use the AI to replace an existing biomarker. Now, we all know that a lot of people have cardiac scans, CD scans, to measure coronary artery calcium score as health screening. And they use it because you have CAC score that's high, you might be higher risk of cardiovascular disease. But how many CD scans are there, whether it's in Singapore or India? And how can people keep using this essentially, right? So one way is that if the current way is to use CD scan to measure coronary artery calcium scores to predict risk of disease, we thought that we would try to use a retinal photograph to estimate the calcium score. And from there, seeing whether the retinal photograph estimated calcium score could also similarly predict disease. And therefore, this fundus photograph estimated CAC score, what we call a RETI CAC score, may replace the expensive use of a cardiac CD scan, which is not available everywhere. So we developed that score and in one cohort study, this shows you the CD scan CAC score. You can see that the higher the score, the higher the risk of cardiovascular disease as we expect. But when we compared it to the retinal photograph CAC score, we found that it could similarly predict the same risk and therefore RETI CAC, which is an estimated CAC score may be comparable to a CD scan CAC score. We then tested this in a population whereby the people with intermediate risk 
In other words, those that were uncertain from, from their standard cardiovascular risk factors, could they be further risk stratified? So this intermediate risk group, where we use the photographs to look at whether we could further risk stratify them, we found that they could be further risk stratified into higher and lower vascular risk. And therefore, it refined further risk prediction in this intermediate uncertain group. These are the patients that are likely to go for a coronary artery calcium score scan because they are uncertain if they have high or low risk. Another way to look at it is to say, can we use another biomarker? Now, some of you will be aware that we have used retinal vessel caliber to measure the retinal vessel diameter as a way of predicting disease. Why do we do that? We've done that because we have found, and many others have shown, that if you have larger venular diameter and narrower arterial diameter, you're at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And so we developed an AI deep learning algorithm that measured the diameter of the artery and the veins. And we went to see whether or not this AI algorithm could also predict cardiovascular disease. So the first thing we did was that we compared the human measurements versus the AI measurement shown in green. And you can see that it showed good correlation. So now you don't need to use humans to slowly measure these retinal vessel diameter, although it's with a computer program, it still requires time. The AI program requires essentially automatically detects the vessel diameter. And in one study, we showed that the smaller the diameter, the higher the risk of cardiovascular disease, and the larger the venular diameter similarly is associated with higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So this suggests that if we were able to automatically measure the retinal vessel diameter, we might be able to predict cardiovascular disease without the use of uh, other techniques. Finally, we can say, let's just predict disease using photographs. Now, in a very interesting paper, again by the Google group, they predicted the presence of anemia, which is a big problem in many countries, in India, in Africa, in other countries, China, and so forth, because many people don't know whether they have anemia or not, using a retinal photograph, and they found a reasonable AUC. We've recently looked at chronic kidney disease, and we found that the retinal photographs only was reasonably useful as compared to uh, risk factors as well as a hybrid model, suggesting that maybe when you screen for diabetic retinopathy, you might also want to screen simultaneously for anemia and chronic kidney disease using the same retinal photographs. So these are future and potentially interesting way of looking at these diseases. Now I've kind of given you two examples. One is diabetic retinopathy screening, which is much more advanced. The other is using the eye to predict systemic disease such as cardiovascular disease, anemia, kidney disease, and so forth. What do we do with such information? The first is that when you want to move research into translation, in other words, can you use it for clinical care? There's always the fear of a black box. In traditional machine learning, because the computer does very little, the black box is smaller, but in deep learning, the black box is larger. So traditional machine learning, there's a small black box and people are not too worried about it. But in deep learning, there's a big black box. And so many people say, why are you telling me that I have anemia or kidney disease? What are you seeing from the photographs? 
And I would say that no one can tell them. I think certainly ophthalmologists, even Professor Natarajan can't say why you have anemia from a photograph. It's not possible. And therefore, there's a fear of this black box. In fact, in the Google paper, they found that of the various things that they could predict, some, for example, like smoking, HbA1c, was located to the blood vessels. So they say, okay, that's fine. It is shown in your blood vessels. But in other areas, like diastolic blood pressure and the body mass index, the algorithm could not say, why is it picking up those signals? So even though it could predict with accuracy why someone has such and such a body mass index, it could not say why it had so. And I think this black box concerns a lot of people. And because of this, people are, and patients are fearful of using AI to predict disease. Now, you all know about driverless cars, when some cars have an accident and there's no reason of why they're having an accident, people are afraid of going into that car. Similarly, they have seen that people are worried about algorithms when they do not know how the algorithm is developed. The second thing is that there must be a lot of physician adoption. One of the big things that ophthalmology does not have yet, but radiologists have for a long time, has been that they have seen it, that machines will take over radiologists' job. And therefore, radiologists keep pushing AI aside because they are worried about their own occupation. So physicians must embrace it. And sometimes physicians are worried about it when they see that things happen wrongly. Now, many years ago, MD Anderson wanted to use AI to predict and to help them with cancer diagnosis. But when what happened with many years later, they simply rejected it because they were not giving correct diagnosis for the physicians. And therefore, patients and physicians did not feel comfortable using that system. So a lot needs to be done. Now, I want to mention that one of the things that has happened, of course, last year, but it will be for many years, actually, probably, uh, I wish the vaccination program could be faster, but, you know, India will take maybe two years, you know, or maybe even three years to vaccinate everybody. And similarly, even other countries, the same problem. So in the COVID, there is, although there's danger, there's an opportunity for AI. And why do we have such an opportunity? In fact, we recently Publish how we have used some digital models here is because we want patients to do not come to the hospital and clock up our system. They should have minimum time in the hospital. They should touch fewer equipment as far as possible. And of course, for our own staff, we are also afraid because many patients that comes in, you do not know whether they are asymptomatic carriers. Sometimes we might have to split teams and we hope to have many of our doctors even work from home and diagnose patients from home. And so in one model, which we were looking at is a virtual clinic for stable retinal diseases. Before COVID, of course, patients would come, have their vision, OCT, see the doctor before they go home. And that takes up a lot of their time in the hospital maybe two, three hours. I think no different from SNEC as in all the hospitals in India. Two, three hours, right? Just the earliest you can get home. So for active disease, you have no choice. They have to come in, they have to get treatment. But what now we are seeing that maybe there are 30% that have stable disease where they can have their vision, history, and OCT, and a review by technicians outside. And soon to be, we add 
artificial intelligence there. And only for those cases that need to be seen, do they come in. And if they don't need to be seen, they therefore can be seen outside. We have piloted this and we are seeing that many patients like this kind of uh, digital virtual clinics. They are now accepting of this because of COVID. So I'm going to conclude this short, but hopefully informative lecture by saying that AI can transform healthcare and ophthalmology. In ophthalmology, the most progress has been for very narrow specific tasks using fundus photograph, such as for diabetic retinopathy screening. I've mentioned this to you. There are many different programs and I'm sure it's going to be piloted and used in India as well. But what is really exciting has been the potential to add on systemic disease prediction and risk stratification. Maybe one day it will replace, as I mentioned, cardiac CD scan, and maybe it can help routinely pick up kidney disease, anemia, stroke, and so forth. So that is an exciting field. I would mention that tele-ophthalmology, the ability to take photos and not need someone seeing you face to face is a very important synergistic technology. And COVID therefore presents that opportunity because many patients now accept that maybe it's better to stay near their homes, not go to crowded hospitals for teleophthalmology and AI. So I hope that gives you an update of AI in ophthalmology. And again, I'd like to thank Dr. Natarajan for the opportunity and the honor to speak. And of course, both of us are celebrating 30th year, unfortunately, in a virtual fashion. One day, I do hope to come to India and visit, just as I would like to welcome everyone to Singapore when there's a chance to visit. It probably won't be this year. We'll be very fortunate if it is possible in 2022. So with that, I'd like to thank you for the honor and opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you, team, for a wonderful talk. I'm happy we have a friend, Ravichandran and Shivanandan, who are also, they both are dead. three are not doctors. They are my well-wishers and with me. Aishwarya to start the question and answer, maybe I requested Shivanandan to ask some questions in case he has any, because he knows that we are also working on AI. We are using the offline AI. I am also working with talking to Daniel Singh, but still not going to get to work to do that. I think it is the time to start working together. And we, we should use technology, because in India we have 47,000 villages. We have 77 million diabetic only diabetes. Imagine A and B and then hepatitis to another B and B or B and B or the macro disease. Even in a so I hope we will follow the NHC and you to work with you and maybe also keep we can use with our mobile phone technology to we'll work together. So uh, Hello, 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 doctor. I thank the chief guest for giving us a wonderful uh, uh, opening. Uh, we, uh, I, I am a cop, you know, so I'm unable to ask you any question about what you spoke. But the involvement of uh, Google, uh, uh, AI, and deep learning, machine learning, and so many other things open a new vista in mm. every field, not only in ophthalmology. Even in policing, all these things are facial recognition system and so many things. But you spoke wonderfully about the teleophthalmology where we don't have to come to the hospital and the future looks so very bright. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much. I've learned a lot, but not exactly about ophthalmology because it's beyond my brains to understand. But I heard you very, very intently. You spoke very well about future science and technology, how it can help the humankind. I can only say that I knew the, the professor uh, N.S. Uh, Sundaram uh, as well as Madam uh, Kamala Sundaram and uh, we are remembering them today. May God bless their souls. And my friend, uh, 
uh, Padma Shri, Dr. Natarajan is carrying their mantle and the like, and then he's doing a wonderful job. And I thank this opportunity for listening to you and uh, also participating in this. Natarajan, asking a cop to ask a question is the wrong thing you're doing. <laughs> I can't ask any question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to listen to you, Dr. Wong. It's a privilege to listen to you. Thank, thank you. you Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Natarajan and Dr. Wong. It was so beautifully put and so simplistically um, conveyed. Um, I would now like to call upon Dr. Aishwarya Ayer, a Vitreo Retina Fellow at Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital to open the floor for a question and answer session. Dr. Aishwarya, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ishita. Uh, first and foremost, sir, I would like to congratulate you. That was a wonderful presentation, excellent talk. And I think as a student, I, I learned a lot from that. Uh, I just have a couple of questions, sir. The first question that I would like to ask is, uh, so how in, in uh, when we talk about deep learning and machine learning and AI, we I, what I understand is that we teach the machine to identify lesions and then we accordingly get a res response from the machine. So in diseases like hypertensive retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy, and a lot of other retinopathies, common lesions that we see are exudates and hemorrhages. So how do you teach the machine to differentiate between a hypertensive retinopathy or a diabetic retinopathy? It just knows that it's, a, it's seeing an exudate or a cotton wool spot or a hemorrhage. How does the machine know that it's because of diabetes or hypertension? Okay, I think that's an excellent question. So maybe... I didn't have time to go into some of the technical details, but I want to uh, mention uh, the concept of machine learning and deep learning and why it is so powerful, right? Uh, machine learning is exactly what you mentioned. If you have a hypertensive or diabetic retinopathy, you do need to identify the exudates, the cotton wool spots, the hemorrhages and microaneurysms and and then tell the machine to say, pick up these, locate it, and keep remembering how these look like, right? That's what we were doing 10 years ago, what we call machine learning. And they do reasonably well. And in the machine learning literature, many years ago, as I said, read some of the older literature, you'll find that the AUCs, the Accuracy is in the 80, 85 performance. So quite nice. In other words, they are able to pick up all those signs that you tell them to. However, 85% performance is nowhere near what we are seeing now with deep learning, which is in the 96, 7, 99% performance. Now, why, do, why is there such a jump? So I will go into the concept of deep learning. In deep learning, you actually do not tell the machines anything about the retinal features. We only, when we train them with that half a million images in hours, and the same thing with what Google did, all they did is to classify disease endpoints and then give them the entire retinal image. They may or may not even be picking up heart exudates or microaneurysm. They may be picking signs of a little bit of tortuosity. Maybe is a little bit of uh, uh, reflex. Maybe it's something to do with the nerve fiber layer. Actually, nobody knows, which is why it's a black box. So when you're training some uh, a machine uh, using deep learning technology, you're only saying this patient's has moderate or worse, which means that they need to be referred. And this patient or this eye has less than moderate, which means they don't need to be referred. Now, they, you don't tell them anything else, essentially. Right? So when they are done this way, the performance is extremely robust, as you can see. They go on to 98, 99% accuracy. So they will see it and will process it, and they will say, I learn whatever I can from the photo to make sure that I will always classify this as accurately as possible on moderate or worse, which is referred, and moderate or less than moderate, which is not referred. 
Now, whether or not they do it because of microaneurysm, heart exudates, no one knows. Because the gold standard when we trained them was the ophthalmologist saying, I want this case referred. Now, if we give them very poor quality images, in other words, we get a trainee to give them those data and there are a lot of severe retinopathy signs in the non-referred group. And in the referred group, there are no signs, in other words, wrongly classified. The machines will learn wrongly because they, they are not told to look at microaneurysms. Now, therefore, this is quite important to have very large database to minimize error and very good gold standard, what we call uh, the ground truth for deep learning. Now, as to then the question of can they therefore differentiate hypertensive from diabetic retinopathy, that's when there are the next step of research needs to happen because the machine is a single leg animal now. All it does well, and it can only do that well, is to separate out diabetic retinopathy, referred, not referred. When you give them hypertensive retinopathy signs, they probably can only tell you again the same thing, referred or not referred diabetic retinopathy. It has nothing and knows nothing about hypertensive retinopathy, which is why many groups are now trying to say, are we able to have multiple disease categories that you give to the machines? And there are now several of these groups, but it is not easy to do this because you almost need to classify as many diseases as possible within a single retinal photo. And you need to differentiate it. And who is the ground truth, even for us, even for retinal specialists, sometimes you see a patient with both hypertension and diabetes. Can you accurately say it is hypertension or diabetic retinopathy? Sometimes you can't. And that's when we are now facing a little bit of those kind of challenges. So as I mentioned before, AI is very good at doing a very specific, narrow task. It's excellent at playing chess, but you use the deep learning algorithm for playing chess and you ask them to play checkers and it, will, it won't be able to do it and you can't do anything else. So I think we are now at the point of outstanding, excellent performance in a narrow specific task, but it doesn't have that generalized artificial intelligence that we hear about and see in movies and so forth, essentially. I hope that answers your question, but at the moment, it cannot differentiate it. Right, so that, that was very enlightening. Uh, so my next question, uh, the, my, my last question would be that, uh, what other uh, specialties of ophthalmology other than retina do you see artificial intelligence uh, taking over? Okay. I don't have much time to go into all this disease because you know it's impossible, as I mentioned, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. The first, I would say glaucoma has a good potential and there's been a lot of good work in the glaucoma field. So retina, of course, AMD, diabetic retinopathy, macular disease, all those, right? Glaucoma is the second very important field that I think has a lot of interest partly because of the following reason. In fact, mainly for the following reason. Number one, they need a lot of tests, right? Visual field, multiple visual fields. They need OCT, retinal nerve fiber layer. Of course, a lot of ophthalmologists can't classify cup disc ratio very accurately. They need to input intraocular pressures, multiple intraocular pressure measurements. So that field is probably one of the more important fields, right? Whereby patients have all these tests and they have a score and that score tells a lot of the general ophthalmologist, do you treat and don't treat and so on and so forth and how long do you see them again? Because glaucoma patients clog up many patients' clinic. I think the eye hospital is stuck with a lot of them. Actually, a lot of them don't progress, but we don't know about this, right? So I think that is very exciting. The other narrow field uh, that uh, people have been talking about, but it's not yet that useful yet, uh, uh, has been in electronic medical records. Uh, and the reason electronic medical records is challenging is because 
the entry for electronic medical records is poor. People put in all various symptoms. Uh, they type in all sorts of signs. Uh, the diagnosis is not always accurate. But what is most exciting would be a day whereby the EMR will allow patients to be risk stratified. So in other words, with these signs and symptoms, you could come back in three years or five years. And with these signs and symptoms, you need to be seen within three months, right? I think that will really help ophthalmologists and eye hospitals because you know, we are stuck with yearly or six monthly follow-up for different patient groups. So these two are what I think are useful for AI in the non-retina field. Excellent, sir. Thank you so much. That, that's all from my side. Over to Ishita. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Aishwarya Ayer, for those wonderful questions. And thank you so much, Dr. Wong, for such in-depth answers. I would now like to call upon Ms. Sanjari Mahadik, an optometrist at Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital, to share the vote of thanks with us. Hi, everybody. I firstly thank Dr. Tain Wong for accepting the, to give this oration and for giving us this precious time today from his busy schedule. Sir. Thank you, sir. I extend my gratitude to the Aditya Jyot family as spearheaded by our dearest professor, Dr. S. Natarajan sir and Radhika ma'am to give his tireless efforts uh, to make this event a grand event. I thank Mr. Ravi Chandran sir and Mr. Shivanandan sir for being the pillars of the support. I also thank Ms. Shruti, Dr. Aishwarya, and Dr. Ishita Ayer for their 100% toward this event. And last but not the least, the coordination, the teamwork, and the technical support from Mrs. Shubha Executive to Dr. Natarajan sir, and our Mr. Samir from IT Executive. Cannot go unmentioned. Thank you so much. I was also privileged to be in Dr. Sundaram sir as student. I also, and I finally thank you, Dr everyone and the viewers and the participations for their enthusiasm and the excitement and participation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Andrani. We shall now be viewing the arrangement of the plague and paying our respects to late Dr. N.S. Sundaram and Mrs. Kamla Sundaram. Over to the team. Thank you, We already handed over the back and the strong to Dr. Tin Wong in Singapore itself. All right. So we have done it here with us. I've already read it in the All right. So thank awesome. you, team, for a time. And yes. that gives me an opportunity. In India, we may have some 50, a small group of uh, meetings may happen from next month. I'm planning to have one of you on the, I know, virtual, because you can't travel now and we can't travel. I was planning to come to Singapore. I contacted Vivian and he said that it's difficult and you have to two weeks quarantine and, and all that. So I said, all right. I, I had the same month last year I was with you in Singapore. And that time I think less we knew that we are going to be affected by Corona in such a big, such a way. And particularly when I was in the NUS. Anyway, I think uh, we'll be happy to work with you and I'm looking forward. And I think it's, it's an exciting field and we should, because I feel AI will work in a great way. As you rightly said, I keep giving talk. AI is not going to replace ophthalmologists. It's going to assist us, and the ophthalmologists have to use it, and they use it in such a way that it will definitely... I also give a talk saying how to increase your revenue by screening diabetic retinopathy. That means hundreds of... We have 7 million, 77 million diabetic, and we only have 23,000 ophthalmologists as all India Ophthalmic Society. And the last two years, I'm struggling. And I've decided next five years we'll work and make sure at least we'll examine all of them. And the only way will be with the AI, whether it's offline or online. And I think we will need your support. Thank you, team. And thanks, my team, and specifically Anil Nair and Akil Nair, who are also working with me. And we have put this as a, a Facebook and YouTube live. The idea is to propagate that patients should also be used to the term AI and how safe it is. Like as you, you mentioned about the driverless car and something like using AI is not going to replace a doctor and doctor will be aided more. Thank you team. And thank you team Aditya Jyot and thank you SNAC. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your time today, esteemed guests. Have a great evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you all soon. Bye. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, team. Ravi. Anyway, uh, uh, Shruti, uh, what's his name? Samir, can you put the YouTube and Facebook off so I, we can use one of the, I want to off my uh, video, sorry, Zoom recording. Uh, Shruti, you can unmute. Ishita, Samir, can you unmute? 